Hello friends, IBM is here with another episode of Learning Physics with me and today I, I would like to take you into one short uh, unit of solved past paper questions that is physics 9704 physics 9704 that is paper 4 advanced uh, structured equations that is advanced structured equations A level and today I would like to take you into uh, astrophysics and cosmology. Astrophysics and cosmology. So without wasting time, I want us to move to the document. I want this video to be as short as, as possible. So we are now on the video, astrophysics and cosmology. This is a new unit for those uh, studying advanced level physics, Cambridge. Uh, this is quite new it is so that's why I have very few questions but still uh, when other I'll, I'll record another video with other questions from other new past papers so this should be just serving as an introduction so uh, some of the constants we may need uh, the solar luminosity that is the luminosity of the Sun which is approximately 3.83 times 10 power 26. This is a constant which I think when required it will always be given. Then we may need a Wayne's constant, although this constant may not be given, it is sometimes the calculations do not require it, because many times the calculations will be comparing two quantities, which where the constant is the same, that the constant always cancels out. We may need uh, Wayne, Stefan Boltzmann's constant, which is 5.67 times 10 power negative 8 watts per meter squared per Kelvin power 4. So let's start. Let us start without wasting time. Explain what you understand by the following, a light year. Although the question about a light year is far beyond uh, the syllabus, I just included it here for completeness because it is also under astrophysics. Because <clears throat> the cosmologists uh, handle large distances, so sometimes um, the unit meters may not be good enough for such large distances. So another unit called light year may be considered for such large distances. So light year is a unit of distance, it's not of time. And light year stands for the distance, The distance, distance traveled by light. Distance traveled by light in a vacuum. Distance traveled by light in a vacuum in a time of one year. So that is the light year, the distance traveled by light in a vacuum in a time of one year, that is a light year. So it, is, it means light year is a unit of distance, it is not a unit of time. Then luminosity of a star, of course the luminosity of the star of a star is the total radiant power emitted by a star. The total radiant, total radiant power emitted total radiant power emitted by a star that is luminosity since power is energy per unit time then luminosity can also be defined as the total radiant energy emitted per unit time by the star Total radiant energy emitted per unit time by a star. Total radiant. Uh, energy emitted by uh, per unit time by a star. Just 
just because um, power is <coughs> energy per unit time. So we can define luminosity by looking at it as total radiant energy emitted per unit time by a star. But three, define radiant flux intensity. Of course, radiant flux intensity refers to the radiant power passing normally through a surface per unit area. The radiant flux, I mean the radiant power. So we normally we shall use L for luminosity and we shall use F for radiant flux intensity. So the radiant power passing the radiant power passing normally through a surface per unit area. Is what we call uh, the radiant flux intensity. In fact, radiant flux intensity could be like the observed or the intensity of a radiation which is received on a given surface area. That is the radiant flux intensity. Okay, state the relationship between radiant flux intensity F and the distance d from the center of the star. So, radiant flux intensity is simply equal to the luminosity divided by 4 pi times d squared, where L is the luminosity. L is the luminosity. The radiant flux intensity F from a star and its distance d are determined by some astronomers. The percentage uncertainty in F is 1.2% and the percentage uncertainty in D is 2.5%. What is the percentage uncertainty in the calculated value of the luminosity of the star? So this would be a, a question of AS, but I will just bring it here for completeness. It is in errors and uncertainties. So the radiant flux intensity F is given by the luminosity over 4 pi times d squared, where d is the distance. So we want uh, the percentage uncertainty of the luminosity. So I'm making L the subject, and since uh, we know uh, uncertainty is from, from AS, so the percentage uncertainty in L should be equal to, because this will be multiplication, this is going to be the percentage uncertainty in F plus twice, percentage uncertainty in D because D is squared. So when you substitute, you notice that the percentage uncertainty in the luminosity is going to be that in F, which is... 1.2 plus uh, 2 times that in D, which is 2.5. And when I press, when you check, this is 1.2 plus 5, which is going to give us 6.2%. So the percentage uncertainty is 6.2%. Neptune is the farthest planet from the Sun in the solar system. Its distance from the Sun is 30 times greater than the distance of the Earth from the Sun. The radiant flux intensity from the Sun at the Earth's surface at the Earth is this. So that is F at the surface of the Earth. A space probe is close to Neptune. Calculate the maximum radiant power received by an, an instrument of cross-sectional area. Let's maintain this as one meter squared on this space probe. Okay, so we want the uh, the maximum radiant power received uh, by an instrument of cross-sectional area one meter squared on this space probe. In other words, we want the radiant flux intensity at Neptune. So I will say flux intensity, radiant flux intensity on the Earth's surface. Let it be L, because the luminosity is the same, it is depending on the sun, over 4 pi. Let the distance from the sun to the star, to the earth, be D. So this would be D squared. I'm using the formula we have written above. Then for Neptune, the radiant flux intensity for Neptune is going to be also the luminosity over 4 pi. But they told us that the sun, 
the, its Neptune's distance from the sun is 30 times greater than that of the earth. If for the earth it is d, then for Neptune here we shall have 30 d, and this is squared. So what remains to combine these two equations and putting what is given? So I'm just going to divide the radiant flux intensity of Neptune over f for Neptune. I mean f the radiant flux intensity of the Earth is equal to I'm dividing the two equations. So for Neptune I have L over uh, 4 pi uh, times um, uh, 30 d squared that is times 9 900 d squared then times I'm getting remember I'm dividing so I have to get the reciprocal times 4 pi d squared divided by L so L has cancelled out L has cancelled 4 pi has also cancelled d squared has also cancelled so the radiant flux intensity the radiant flux intensity here is we are meaning with 1 over 900 so we make f n the subject so f n is going to be 1 over 900 times the radiant flux intensity of the earth which is 1 400 so i press my calculator When I press my calculator, this gives me 1.56 watts per meter squared. So that is 1.56. Explain what is meant by a standard candle. Of course, your teacher must have told you that a standard candle is an astronomical object which has a known luminosity. An astronomical object whose luminosity is known is a standard candle. An astronomical of course, astronomical refers to objects in space. An astronomical object which has a known luminosity. For instance, the sun could be considered a standard candle if its luminosity is uh, well established. So any astronomical object whose luminosity is known is considered to be a standard candle. Two stars, sorry, the two well-known standard candles are type 1a supernovae and cepheid variable stars. Briefly describe the, the main features of each candle. So the type 1 Spanovi, that is in memory of Swan Henriette, Henrietta Swan, the female astronomist. Uh, the type 1 is Spanovi. These ones are uh, implode, or if you want to can say explode, but implode is the best. These implode. They implode rapidly. These implode rapidly towards the end of their lives. They implode rapidly towards the end of their lives. And scatter matter. They scatter matter. and energy and energy out into space this scatter matter and the energy out into space and involve they involve white dwarfs
So at the end of their lives, they scatter matter out and energy out into space, and they result they may result into white dwarfs at the end of their lives. Then the Cepheid variable stars, they are var they, something must be varying, and in this case it is their brightness. These ones have their brightness increase and decrease rapidly. So brightness increases and decreases. Brightness increases and decreases rapidly. Brightness increases, not rapidly, periodically. Their brightness increases and decreases periodically. So radiations, uh, um, astronomers believe that the period of increase and decrease in brightness is related to the average luminosity of the star. And if we know that, if we know the period, if we know the period the star increases and decreases its brightness, then astronomers think such a star can hope or can act as a standard candle to hope uh, determining other or taking several other measurements. So brightness increases and decreases periodically. The period of the period is related to The period is related to the average luminosity to the average luminosity of the star. The period is related to the average luminosity of the star. State Wayne's displacement law, so this would be a common equation. Wayne was interested in establishing the relationship between the temperature, surface temperature and uh, the wavelength at which maximum intensity of black body radiation occurs. And his observation shows that the wavelength at which maximum intensity of radiation from a black body occurs is inversely proportional to up to its absolute temperature or thermodynamic temperature. So the wavelength the wavelength at which the wavelength at which maximum intensity Wavelength at which maximum intensity of radiation from a black body occurs. The wavelength at which maximum intensity of radiation from a black body occurs is inversely. Proportional to its absolute temperature. It is inversely proportional to its absolute temperature. Sketch uh, the variation of intensity of radiation emitted with wavelength of a blacker body at three different temperatures. So from when is displacement law, we are seeing that the wavelength at which maximum intensity is occurring is inversely proportional to its temperature. So as temperature increases, the maximum intensity occurs at smaller wavelength. So I am going to draw three, um, three different temperatures. I'm going to draw graphs showing three different temperatures. So it is a graph of intensity. So I will try to be very accurate. It's a graph of intensity against wavelength.
So I'm sketching graphs of intensity against wavelength. So graph of intensity against wavelength for three temperatures. Remember, the wavelength at which maximum intense, that is where the peak is, shifts to smaller values of wavelength as temperatures increase. So I'm going to sketch for three different temperatures. As temperatures increase, the peaks should be tending towards the vertical axis. Okay, so for the first temperature, So this is for temperature T1. For the second temperature, so you see my peak is shifting towards uh, towards lower values. So this is for temperature T2. And for the third temperature, so this will be T3. So I will just tell the examiner that T3 is greater than T2, which is greater than T1. So you see that the peaks, my peaks are actually shifting Towards, um, my peaks have shifted towards, maybe I can try to, to rectify this one. I want to the peak to be narrower. Okay, so you see that uh, the peaks have shifted towards towards the left. That is according in accordance with Wayne's displacement law. The wavelength at which maximum intensity occurs is inversely proportional to is inversely proportional to uh, the absolute temperature. So as temperatures increase, maximum intensity occurs at shorter wavelength. In other words, the peaks tend towards the y-axis. So that is the graph that you are expected to draw. This is very important because it tells the examiner which temperature is greater so that the examiner will know that temperature is increasing as you move towards the one end. Okay. Next. The sun may be considered a blacker body. Remember, a blacker body absorbs all radiations falling on it without reflecting any. And it actually emits a full spectrum of wavelengths ranging from radio waves, which Rumenera's mother is visiting Uncle Xavier's garden. These are electromagnetic waves. Rumenera's mother is visiting Uncle Xavier's garden. Richard's mother is visiting Uncle Xavier's garden. So a uh, blacker ball will emit all these wavelengths without um, leaving out any but it absorbs all wavelengths uh, falling on it without reflecting any. So the sun may be considered a blacker body whose surface temperature is that, and that emits uh, radiation with wavelength 430 nanometers. Catch the surface temperature of Sirius if the wavelength of the radiation it emits is 74 nanometers. 
So this is also an easy question, lambda max. Remember from when is displacement to lambda max is equal to a constant over T. Or is lambda max is inversely proportional to, to temperature. Note that lambda max does not mean maximum wavelength, but it means the wavelength at which maximum intensity occurs. Wavelength at which maximum intensity occurs. So we just, uh, since we want temperature of cirrus, we shall just come up with two equations. So T times lambda max is equal to a constant. T times lambda max will be equal to a constant. I'm calling it B. Even if I don't substitute B. So T for the sun, T for the sun times lambda max for, for the sun, which is, well, I'll just substitute the values. Because T for the sun is known, I will just substitute the values to save time. T for the sun is 5,800 times lambda max for the sun, which is 430 nanometers. I will not convert nanometers because I need to cancel. This is equal to a constant. Also, T for cirrus, which is not known. I will call T cirrus, which is not known, times the wavelength of cirrus, which is 74 nanometers, is also equal to the same constant. So we just divide the two equations, the constant disappears, and when you divide the two equations, you have the T cirrus, or you equate the two equations, no problem. You find that T cirrus, or the temperature of cirrus, is going to be equal to 430 nanometers, Divide by 74 nanometers times 5,800. Times 5,800. So when we press the calculator, So from my calculator, I am getting a 3.4 times 10 power, power 4 Kelvin. 3.4 times 10 power 4 Kelvin. State Stefan Boltzmann's, Boltzmann's law. Stefan Boltzmann's law. That is very easy. Power per unit area radiated by a blacker body is directly proportional to the fourth power of its thermodynamic temperature. The power per unit area. Remember the power is the luminosity. The power radiated is the luminosity. The power per unit area radiated by a black body is directly proportional is directly proportional to the fourth power Directly proportion to the fourth spelling of fourth is directly proportional to the fourth the fourth power of its thermodynamic temperature. The power per unit area of a blacker body. Power per unit area of a blacker body is directly proportional to the fourth power of the thermodynamic temperature. Remember, power is the luminosity, so luminosity is equal to a constant, which we are going to call sigma times area times t power 4. Power is the area, I mean the power is the luminosity, 
the power radiated by the body is the luminosity. So uh, luminosity is going to be a constant times area t power have removed the proportion proportionality sign. And the area is 4 pi r squared, where r must be the radius. Sigma is going to be called Stefan Boltzmann's constant. So state two factors on which luminosity of a star depends. So we know that luminosity is directly proportion to the temperature, and luminosity is also directly proportion to the area. So area can be determined by the radius or diameter. So we can say luminosity is depending on two factors, majorly that is the surface temperature. The surface temperature, that is T power 4. It is also depending on the size of, of the star. When I say size of the star, I am actually referring to either the radius, because the radius will determine the size, or the diameter of the star. So that is, those are the factors on which luminosity depend. A metosphere of radius 1.5 centimeters suspended with, um, within a vacuum, an evacuated enclosure whose walls are at 320 Kelvin. Find the power, find the power input required to maintain the sphere at a temperature of 320 Kelvin heat conduction along supports is negligible. So remember the luminosity, we want the power input, that is the luminosity actually. So power per unit area is the luminosity, so L is going to be equal to 4 pi r squared, that is the area, times sigma times t power 4. This expression is always given in the list of formula. So this is going to be 4 pi times the radius is 1.5 times 10 power negative 2 to change it to meters but this is squared then times stefan Boltzmann's constant which is 5.67 times 10 power negative 8 this is always given then times the temperature which is 320 raised power 4. Let me check my calculator. From my calculator, this is 1.68. 1.68. Next, next. Explain what is meant by the cosmological redshift or simply redshift. What do we mean by the cosmological redshift? So a light from distant galaxies is observed to be uh, redshifted. In other words, it is observed to be traveling a longer and longer distance because from the visible spectrum, red corresponds to the longest wavelength. So what we mean by red shift is the fractional increase in wavelength. Of course, since wavelength is inversely proportional to frequency, it is a decrease in the frequency of light due to the source and the observer moving away from each other or receding from each other. The opposite would be called a blue shift. That is, if the source and the observer are moving towards each other, it would be called a blue shift. So the fractional increase, the fractional increase in wavelength The fractional increase in wavelength, or call it a decrease in frequency. In the frequency of light due to the source, due to the source. and observer receding from each other.
that is uh, the ready shift. I said if it was if the uh, the, the wavelength was decreasing or the frequency was increasing because the source and observer are moving towards each other, it would be called a blue shift. So light from distant galaxies is observed to be ready shifted. In other words, it appears as if galaxies are moving away from the Earth. And if galaxies are moving away from the Earth, since we cannot assume to be at the center of the universe, perhaps we are also moving away from those galaxies. So could it be that the universe is expanding? That is now uh, the Big Bang. Explain why the cosmological ready shift leads to the idea that the universe is expanding. Explain why the cosmological ready shift leads to the idea that the universe is expanding. What does the ready shift imply? The ready shift is implying that the wavelengths of the spectral lines in light, uh, in light from uh, stars is actually greater than their known values in the laboratory. So it means ready shift is implying that the expansion is stretching out light as it travels through space. Remember, red corresponds to the longest wavelength. Therefore, it implies that the galaxies are moving apart. The ready shift shows stars in distant galaxies are actually moving away from the Earth even faster. Therefore, the universe must be expanding. So we can say the wavelengths of spectral lines the wavelengths the wavelengths of spectral lines of spectral lines in light in light from from stars are greater than their known values So the wavelengths, the wavelengths of spectral lines, remember spectral lines are as a result of either emission or absorption of absorption by atoms in ele or electrons of atoms in uh, of the elements through which light is passing. So the wavelengths of spectral lines in light from stars are actually observed to be greater than their known values in the laboratory. Red corresponds to the longest wavelength. So the red shift implies red corresponds to the longest wavelength. So the ready shift implies that the expansion stretches out the light as it travels through space. The ready shift implies the ready shift implies that the expansion stretches out the light as it travels as it travels through space As it travels through space. Thus, galaxies are moving. Thus, galaxies are moving apart. 
the ready shift implies that the expansion stretches out light as it travels through space. Thus, galaxies are moving apart. So redshift shows stars in distant galaxies are moving away from the Earth. The redshift shows stars in distant galaxies are moving away from the Earth. Redshift the red, red corresponds to the longest wavelength. The redshift implies that the expansion stretches out to the light as it travels through space. Thus, galaxies are moving apart and away from the Earth. What is very important to note is that the more ready shift light from a galaxy is, the further it is moving, it is getting. The more the more ready shifted the more ready shifted light from The more already shifted light from a galaxy is the further it is getting. The further it is getting. Okay. A galaxy has a recession speed of the galaxy has a recession speed of 9,400 kilometers per second. Calculate the fractional change in the wavelength of the observed spectrum. Of course, the ready shift is given by lambda delta lambda over lambda is equal to delta F over F, which is going to be V over C. The expression is going to be given in the list of formula. So, and it will be labeled ready shift, cosmological ready shift, or ready shift is given by that. So we want uh, the fractional change. Of course, the fractional change cannot have a unit. That is just a typing error. The fractional change, we want the fractional change. So we just substitute. This is going to be at the speed, which is 9400. This is in kilometers, so I'll multiply times 10 power 3 to change it to meters per second. Divide by the speed of light, which is 3 times 10 power 8. If I check my calculator, 9400 exponent 3, divide by 3 exponent 8. So the fractional change is 0 0.031. I'm saying a fractional change cannot have a unit. So we cannot have nanometers there. So that is just a typing error. The fractional change is 0.031. The figure below shows recession speed V against distance D for some galaxies as obtained by Edwin Hubble's telescope. Describe how the recessional speed V of a distant galaxy can be determined using a diffraction rating to analyze the light from the galaxy. When somebody talks about a diffraction rating from your values of from your AS, remember N lambda is equal to d sine theta for diffraction grating, where n was the order, lambda was wavelength, d was the slit separation, and theta was the angle of diffraction. So light is passed through a diffraction grating. So how are we going to use a diffraction grating to analyze the light from the galaxy? So one, light from a distant galaxy is going to be directed through a diffraction grating. Light. from a distant galaxy is directed is directed through a diffraction grating through a diffraction grating
and the wavelengths. And the wavelength. And the wavelength of the spectral lines. I will call it the wavelength lambda of spectral lines. Is determined. Is determined from d sine theta is equal to n lambda. So the wavelength is determined from that formula. Then the wavelength of an identical line. So let's consider a single line here. And the wavelength lambda of a spectral line. Let me consider a spectral line, just one. And the wavelength lambda of a spectral line is determined. Then the wavelength of an identical line in the laboratory is also determined. The wavelength of an identical line Wavelength of an identical line in the laboratory is also determined. It's also determined. And the difference And the difference delta lambda, I will call delta lambda in wavelengths is determined. So the difference in the wavelengths is determined. So then the speed V is obtained from and the speed V is obtained from the expression delta lambda over lambda is equal to V over C, where C is the speed of light. So that is just a simple explanation. Light from a distant galaxy must be passed through a diffraction grating. And uh, the wavelength of a given line is, is determined. Then light, uh, the wavelength of an identical line can also be determined in the laboratory and the difference is obtained. So the speed, the recessional speed of a distant galaxy can be now obtained from the expression for the Doppler redshift, shift, which is that one. Okay. Explain what the scattering of the data obtained above says. So you see scattering of data from Hubble's, Hubble's telescope. So that uh, scattering shows that there is a random error or there are random errors in the, in the observations. So scattering shows random errors. Random errors you know, in the observations. Scattering shows random errors in observations. Sirius A is moving towards the Earth at a relative velocity of this one. Calculate the percentage change in the wavelength of a spectral line observed from that this is star compared with an identical spectral line observed in the laboratory. So the change in wavelength over the wavelength is equal to V over C. So this is going to be the speed is 7600 divided by the speed of light 3 times 10 power 8. We want this as percentage, so I'll multiply by 100. So that is percentage. So for my calculator. So this is giving me 2.5. 2 times 10 power negative 3. So 2.5 times 10 power negative 3 percent. OK. 
Okay, so that is the percentage change in the wavelength. A student suggests that the distance of Sirius A can be uh, calculated using Hubble's law. And the student, the speed is given, and the speed given Roman one. Discuss whether this suggestion is correct. So um, Hubble's law states that the recessional speed of galaxies moving away from the Earth is proportional to their distance from the Earth. So Hubble's law is applying to distant galaxies. Hubble's law cannot be used to as uh, objects in our own galaxy. So I think the student the student suggestion is not correct. So we can say it is incorrect. It is incorrect. Hubble's law only. Hubble's law only applies to distant to distant receding galaxies. Hubble's law only applies to distant receding galaxies. It does not apply to stars in our own galaxy because Sirius is in our own galaxy. So it doesn't apply to stars in our own galaxy. State Hubble's law, I've already stated this. The recession of the uh, speed, the recession, or recession is from receding. To recede is to move away. The recession of speed, or you say the receding speed. The recession of speed of galaxies the recessional speed of galaxies of galaxies moving away moving away from the earth is proportional to their distance from the earth. The recessional speed of galaxies moving away from the Earth is proportional to their distance from, from the Earth. So the receding speed of a galaxy moving away from the Earth is proportional to its distance from the Earth. Simply, Hubble's law V is equal to H0 times D, where H0 is going to be Hubble's constant. Okay, so explain how Hubble's law leads to the Big Bang Theory. How does Hubble's law lead to the Big Bang Theory? That is the beginning of everything. Okay, so this, um, if galaxies are moving away from each other, then all parts of the universe must be moving away from each other. That is if, uh, if Hubble's law is actually correct. Because it is suggesting that uh, galaxies are moving away at a speed which is directly proportional to the distance from the Earth. So if galaxies are moving away from each other, then all parts of the universe should be moving out from each other. And the more distant objects, uh, the more distant objects must actually be moving away faster. This means matter and all objects must actually have started from the same dense singular point in the past as proposed by the Big Bang. If we can extrapolate data from Hubble's law, then we can, we can trace the beginning of everything. That is where the universe started expanding from. 
okay so uh, if galaxies are receding away from each other according to Hubble's if galaxies if galaxies are receding away from from each other if galaxies are receding away from each other then all parts all parts of the universe then all parts of the universe are moving away from each other. All parts of the universe are moving away from each other and More distant objects must be moving away faster. More distant objects must be moving away faster. More distant objects must be moving away faster. This means, this means matter, this means matter and all objects this means matter and all objects must have must have started from the same dense singular point in the past and all objects must have started from the same dense singular point in the past so matter and all objects must have started from the same dense singular point in the past of course data from Hubble's law can be uh, extrapolated back to the point that the universe started expanding as suggested by the big bang so thus data from Hubble's data from Hubble's data from Hubble's law can be extrapolated to extrapolate is like to take it backwards can be extrapolated back to the point to the point that the universe started expanding the universe to the point that the universe started expanding as suggested by the big bang as suggested by the big bangs so the big bang suggests that the universe started as a small dense a small infinite dense singular point 
which tremendously started expanding. And during the expansion, the density decreased as the temperature also started decreasing. So data from Hubble's law can be extrapolated back, can be, uh, can be taken backwards so that we can trace the, the beginning of everything as suggested by the Big Bang Theory. Okay, next, explain briefly what is meant by the Big Bang. What is meant by the Big Bang? So what do we mean by the Big Bang, briefly? Of course, the Big Bang is just an idea which tells us about the origin of the universe in a contrast with the creationist theory, which tells us that uh, in the beginning, God created the universe or God created uh, everything. So the Big Bang gives another uh, idea of how the universe started. So this is just an idea. You can agree with it or disagree with it. It's just an idea. And for it, it suggests um, that the universe started as a hot, infinitely dense, singular point. This point tremendously began to expand very rapidly. This expansion led to a, a cooling, resulting into the current temperature of about 3 Kelvin. And of course, the universe as a black body uh, is associated with microwaves at a temperature of about 3 Kelvin uh, with the same intensity in actually all directions. So microwaves can be detected in all every part of the universe. And the ready shift is evidence that the universe is still expanding. So we can simply say the Big Bang is the idea. The idea that the universe, the idea that the universe the universe started as a hot, infinitely dense, very dense infinite dense singular point the universe started as uh, a hot infinitely dense singular point which tremendously began to expand very rapidly. Which tremendously began to expand very rapidly. This expansion This expansion led to cooling. This expansion led to cooling, resulting resulting into uh, the current temperature. resulting into the current temperature of about uh, 3 Kelvin. It's around 2.7 Kelvin, but it's approximately 3 Kelvin. So those are almost 3 out of 5, or 4 out of 5 max. Because we have suggested that it is just an idea that the universe started as a small, as a hot, infinite, dense singular point, that is one mark. Rapidly started expanding those two marks. The expansion led to cooling, those are three marks. The temperature of about three Kelvin. The universe as a blacker body. The universe as a blacker body.
is associated. The universe has a blacker body is associated with uh, microwaves. The microwaves at this temperature. That is at a temperature of about 3 Kelvin. Uh, with, this, with the same intensity, with the same intensity, in all directions. With the same intensity in all directions. The ready shift The ready shift is evidence that the universe the ready shift is evidence that the universe is still expanding. The ready shift is evidence that the universe is still expanding. The ready shift is evidence that the universe is still expanding. So up to date, the universe is still expanding. Until when it will continue expanding, is still a mystery. And to where it is expanding, it is you can you can think about it. A galaxy is found to be moving away with a speed of 4.2 times 10 power 7 meters per second. A galaxy is at a distance of 19.0 times 10 power 24 meters. Determine the age of the universe in years. State an assumption made. So we want to determine the age of the universe. Of course, that is time. So time is equal to distance. Time is going to be distance divided by the speed. So if the galaxy is moving at a um, speed of that and it is at a distance of that, then the time it has moved for that distance should be 19.0 times 10 power 24 divided by the speed, which is 4.2 times 10 power 7. We are going to assume that the speed has remained a constant ever since it started uh, moving away and when I press my calculator time is time is going to be 4.4.523 4 times 10 power 17 seconds so that is the time. And I want you to note that the age of the universe is actually going to be this time. Because according to Hubble's law, how, uh, the age of the universe is the reciprocal of Hubble's constant. And this time is going to give us the reciprocal of Hubble's constant. So that is the age in seconds. If I want this one in years, I will divide this by um, 4.523 times 10 power 17. I will divide this by... Um, one year is 3,000, 3.15 times 10 power 17 seconds. So I'll divide this by 3.15 times 10 power 7 seconds. And this gives me, so this is giving me a 14 point, I mean 1.44. Times 10 power 10 in years, which is the same as 14.4 uh, times 10 power 9 in years. In other words, the, the age of the universe is approximately 14 billion years. 
approximately 14 billion years approximately 14 billion years assumption i've assumed that the receding speed remained constant i'm assuming that the receding speed has remained constant Receding speed remained constant ever since the starting, ever since the, the universe, I mean, the, ever since the universe started expanding. The answer in Roman 1 is from the observation on one galaxy alone. Describe how the astronomers can obtain a much more reliable value for the age of the universe from a graph of V against D for many galaxies. Of course, if we have plotted the graph of V against D, that is now according to Hubble's law, that will be a straight line. And we shall just determine the gradient of the graph. So determine the gradient. Determine the gradient of the graph. Uh, which gives an uh, the gradient of course will give us an average value of Hubble's constant because v is equal to h naught times d. The gradient will give us an average value of h naught. So which gives uh, which gives an average which gives an average value. Uh, for Hubble's constant. The gradient gives an average value for Hubble's constant. So it gives an average value for Hubble's constant, call it H0. Then the age of the universe is going to be the reciprocal. The age of the universe Is the reciprocal. Is the reciprocal of this gradient. The age of the universe is the reciprocal of this gradient. In other words, age is equal to one over h naught. H will be equal to 1 over H naught. Use your answer in uh, to Roman 1. Use your answer to Roman 1 to estimate the farthest distance D that astronomers can observe from, from the Earth. Okay, just a food for thought. Uh, you can try to check out. Uh, we have seen um, that uh, we, we rely on light coming from distant stars and we want to estimate the farthest distance. So the first, farthest distance, distance is equal to speed times time. Distance is speed times time and the speed of course, since we are relying on light, we shall consider the uh, the speed of light, that is three times ten power eight. Then for the time, the time of course we can we should we should estimate the edge. We should use the edge of the universe to be the time, and we have seen in the previous part that the edge of the universe is five point uh, I mean four point five two three times ten power seventeen seconds. So I can check with my calculator. So you can also verify this is 1.4 times 10 power 26. You can verify.
So the figure below shows some of the energy levels of electrons in hydrogen gas atoms. The energy levels are labeled A, B, C, and D. Explain why the energy levels are negative. Explain why the energy levels are negative. Of course, that is quantum physics. Uh, we know that energy of a free electron is maximum at infinity, and unfortunately, it is zero. Energy is maximum at infinity and it is zero. So the energy of a free electron is zero at infinity and is maximum. An electron, uh, of course, that is from electric fields. Uh, electric potential energy is zero at infinity. Note that in an atom, electrons are actually bound to the nucleus. So there is a force of attraction between the atom, I mean the nucleus and the electron. So to take an electron far away so that it is free, energy is, is gained by the electron. Because the force of attraction is pulling it towards the nucleus. So it gains an elect and it gains energy when it is taken away, yet at infinity the energy is zero. So it means less than infinity, the energy is less than zero. So electrons are tightly bound. Electrons are tightly bound. Electrons are tightly bound uh, to the nucleus. Electrons are tightly bound to the nucleus and they must gain they must gain energy So energy of a free electron is zero at infinity the electrons are tightly uh, uh, electrons are tightly bound Electrons are tightly bound to the nucleus and must gain energy uh, to leave the atom and must gain energy to leave the atom. They must gain energy to leave the atom. So if they must gain energy to leave the atom, yet at infinity it is zero, then it means the energy of an electron in the atom is less than that of a free, uh, of a free electron. So we can say that the total, the total energy, the total energy of an electron, the total energy of an electron in the atom. Is less is less than that of a free electron. Total energy of an electron in the atom is less than that of a free electron. Okay. Next. Uh, an electron makes a transition from level C to A, level A. So C, this is the energy, and A, this is uh, C to A, that is the energy. So calculate the gain, the energy gained by the electron in electron volts. So at A, the energy is negative 0 0.85, and at C, it's negative 3.4. So the change in energy is negative, negative 0 0.85 minus negative 3.40. When you subtract,
This is 2.55. 2.55. Okay. I have to pause at this point. Just pausing for a few seconds. Okay, so um, the energy the energy is 2.55 electron volts. Let's proceed. Sorry for that interruption. Calculate the wavelength in nanometers of the photon absorbed by this electron. So we have got the energy, and you remember energy of a photon. The energy of a photon is equal to HF which is equal to hc over the wavelength. So it means the wavelength is going to be hc divided by the energy. So the, uh, the energy is 2.55 electron volts. So that is that implies that the wavelength is going to be 6.63 times 10 power negative 34. That is Planck's constant times 3 times 10 power 8 speed of light. Divide by the energy, which is 2.55 times uh, 1.6 times 10 power negative 19 to change it from electron volts to joules. So I press my calculator. So from my calculator, I find the wavelength as being uh, 490 nanometers. Remember nanometers, I have to divide this by 10 power negative 9. To bring in a prefix, you divide by its value. To remove a prefix, we multiply by its value. Light from a distant galaxy is passed through a diffraction grating. The figure below shows uh, the part of the spectrum of light that shows a strong hydrogen alpha emission line. So we see a hydrogen alpha emission line, which has relatively the highest intensity, and it is uh, occurring at this wavelength there, which is, I think, um, it is in the middle of this. That is 661.5. State how an emission line is produced. Of course, emission, that is transition from high energy levels to lower energy levels. Since it is just one mark, I will just say an electron makes a transition. An electron makes a transition. An electron makes a transition uh, from a high energy level to a lower to a lower energy level. Losing energy. Losing energy or giving out energy as it emits a photon. So that's why we are going to have that uh, those line those those lines. The line spectrum is as a result of electron transition. So since it is an emission line spectrum, then the transition should be from a high energy level to lower energy levels. State an adjustment that could be made to the experimental arrangement that would space the emission lines more widely. Spacing. Of course, light is passed through a diffraction grating. And remember, for a diffraction grating, d sine theta, d sine theta is equal to n times lambda. So it means theta is inversely proportional to d, where d is the slit separation. Of course, when theta increases, it means the lines are moving further apart. So one, if we reduce d, we can increase theta. So number one, reduce, reduce the grating slit separation. Reduce the grating slit separation. 
Number two, of course, if we move the screen further away from the grating, still uh, the slit, the, the lines become more widely spaced, so we can increase increase the distance. Increase the distance between uh, the grating and the screen. Increase the distance between the grating and the screen. So this makes uh, this makes theta larger. Oh, it makes the lines more spaced. I just want to stop there. It makes the lines to be more widely spaced. If you move the screen further from the grating, then the lines, uh, the, the spectral lines move further apart or appear to be moving further apart. Okay. In the laboratory, the wavelength of a hydrogen alpha emission line is, so this is in the laboratory. 656.3 nanometers in the bar the laboratory. Use the figure above to determine the recessional velocity of the galaxy. So from the figure we see that uh, light from a distant galaxy, the, uh, the hydrogen alpha emission line is occurring at this point here, which is uh, this is 661.5. It is in the middle of the two the, the two the two marks. So it means the wavelength the wavelength of the peak intensity is um, wavelength of the peak intensity is 661.5 nanometers. So using uh, the formula already shift delta lambda over lambda is equal to V over C. It means V will be equal to that fraction, which is going to be the difference in the wavelengths, which is 661.5 minus in the laboratory, 656.3, divided by the wavelength in the laboratory, which is 656.3. Then this will be multiplied by the speed of light. I'm making V the subject, so that will be times 3 times 10 power 8. Simply press my calculator. So from my calculator, I'm getting the velocity as 2.4 times 10 power 6. 2.4 times 10 power 6. Suggest so why hydrogen spectral lines play an important role in determining ready shift of galaxies. So why do we rely on hydrogens uh, on hydrogen spectral lines? This specific why hydrogen? Hydrogen is in large abundance in most of the stars, which are in these galaxies. So that's why it plays an important role. So there is, there is a large, there is a relatively high abundance high abundance there is a relatively high abundance of hydrogen in stars there is a relatively high abundance of hydrogen in stars that's why it serves uh, it serves a very important role in determining the redshift. So the spectral lines of hydrogen are the most popularly used to determine the redshift. Okay, the recession of speed V against distance D graph for some galaxies is shown here. Of course, this is in accordance with Hubble's law. Deduce the Hubble's constant H0 from the graph and explain your answer. So it is very easy. Since according to Hubble's law, the recession of velocity v is directly proportional to the distance, so which implies that v is going to be equal to h naught times d. Since uh, we have plotted v against d, then it means h naught is the gradient. So I will simply say Hubble's constant h naught is equal to the gradient 
Hubble's constant is equal to the gradient, so I just obtained the gradient from the graph. I will obtain the gradient from the graph. I'm trying to look for a more favorite point, maybe this one. So I will read this is 2. And on the y axis, this is the scale on the vertical is 2 divided by 5, that is 0 0.4. So 2.4.4, 4.8. 5.2 that is 5.2 so i'll have 5.2 minus 0 divided by 2.0 minus 0 I just this is a very simple graph but on the x-axis we have 10 power 24 so this would be times 10 power 24 on the y-axis we have 10 power 6 so this should be times 10 power 6 I press my calculator, 5.2 exponent, 6 divided by 2 exponent, 24. So this is giving me a 2.6 2 times 10 power negative 18 per second. Of course, since it is the units, you can check uh, the gradient on the vertical. We have meters per second. We have meters per second on the vertical, and on the horizontal we have meters. So the unit will be per second because the meters has cancelled. Okay. Light from a galaxy is passed through a diffraction grating. The diagram shows part of the emission, uh, emission spectrum. The strong emission spectral line has wavelength 662. Capture the energy of a photon of that wavelength. So energy of a photon, we now know energy is equal to HF, which is HC of a wavelength. This is quantum physics. So that is 6.63 times 10 power negative 34 times 3 times 10 power 8 that is the speed of light divided by the wavelength is 662 nanometers so that is 662 times 10 power negative 9 millimeters so i check my calculator So this is 3.0 times 10 power negative 19 joules, but we have to change it to electron volts. So in electron volts, this would be 3.0 times 10 power negative 19. Divide this with 1.6 times 10 power negative 19 to change it to electron volts. And this gives me 1.8 eight electron volts so that is the energy explain how a spectral line is produced by electrons within atoms now this time it is more max how are spectral lines produced remember i have said the spectral line is produced as a result of electron transition now if it is an emission spectrum an emission spectral line then it's from a higher energy level to lower energy level if it is an absorption spectral line it is from a lower energy level to a higher energy level so electrons in atoms absorb photons. Electrons in an atom absorb photons. Absorb photons of energy equal to equal to uh, the difference equal to the difference in energy levels equal to the difference in energy levels 
So electrons in atom in an atom absorb photons of energy equal to the difference in energy levels. Remember, we have discrete energy levels. So on the excitation, on the excitation, on the excitation, electrons lose energy. Electrons lose energy as they emit, as they emit photons. So on the excitation, the electrons will lose energy as they emit those photons. In the laboratory, the same spectral line has a wavelength of that. Capture the speed of the galaxy. So we just use the ready shift. From the ready shift equation, uh, delta lambda over lambda is v over c, which means the speed v is going to be equal to, I'm now substituting, difference in wavelength would be 662 minus 656 divided by in the laboratory 656. We divide with the wavelength in the laboratory because it's the actual wavelength. Then this is times c, so c is 3 times 10 power 8. So I press my calculator. So this is simply 2.74 times 10 power 6. State the direction of travel. Of course, the wavelength in the laboratory is smaller than the wavelength from distant from, from light coming from a distant galaxy. Therefore, the galaxy must be receding away from us. So it is receding, receding away, receding away from, from us. So it must be receding away from us. State and explain what the wavelength of the same spectral line would be for a much more distant galaxy. If it is much more distant, it is farther away. So it must be moving faster. It must be more ready shifted. So since it is much more distant galaxy, it must be more ready shifted. So the wavelength is going to be longer. State and explain what the wavelength of the same spectral line would be for a much more distant galaxy. So the wavelength will be longer. Wavelength is longer. Wavelength is longer since the galaxy is moving faster. Because the more distant galaxy must be moving faster. Since the galaxy is moving since the galaxy is moving faster. And by the way, the spectral lines will be even more intense. And the spectral lines, the spectral lines will be more intense. Okay, so the spectral lines will be more intense. Explain why galaxies do not collapse on each other. If galaxies are moving out from each other, then the question is, why don't they collapse on each other? So the reason as to why galaxies uh, may not collapse on each other are very easy. Maybe the acceleration is too small for the collapse to occur. Yes, they could be moving or receding out from each other, but maybe the acceleration uh, of these galaxies or the receding um, speed is small for the for the collapse to occur, and we can predict that maybe it would occur over a very very long period of time because the acceleration is too small. Alternatively, there could be other galaxies pulling those others. Other galaxies may be pulling them in opposite directions. 
That's why they are not actually collapsing on each other. The galaxies could be receding away from each other because of the Big Bang. That is, if all galaxies originated from the same singular point, then there is no way they will collapse from, uh, with each other since they are all moving away from the same point where they originated. Therefore, we have several reasons or several ways of looking at this as to why galaxies do not collapse on each other. So one, somebody could look at it as other galaxies. Other galaxies may be pulling may be pulling them in opposite directions. So there is no chance of collapsing. Alternatively, according to the Big Bang, the galaxies are receding. The galaxies are receding away from, from each other because of the Big Bang. The galaxies are receding away from each other because of, because of the Big Bang. Alternatively, if they would collapse with each other, then it would take a long period of time because maybe the acceleration is too small for the collapse to occur. The acceleration of these galaxies is too small. The acceleration is too small for the collapse. for the collapse to occur. The acceleration is too small for the collapse to occur. Perhaps, it would occur It would occur over a very 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 long period of time. Maybe it would occur over a very very long period of time. Okay. Suggest a reason why it is difficult to predict the future of the universe. Of course, we normally uh, rely on Hubble's constant or Hubble's law to predict uh, the origin of the universe by extrapolating Hubble's data backwards. Therefore, we can also use uh, Hubble's law to predict the, uh, the future of the universe. But since it is the Hubble's constant is not actually known, then all that we shall be doing will be just estimates. So Hubble's constant is not actually known. Hubble's constant, that is, we normally use H naught for Hubble's constant, is not actually known. Hubble's constant is not actually known, so it becomes hard to predict the future of the universe. In addition to that, there are strange things that have been uh, that exist today, things like the black holes, neutrinos, dark matter, dark energy. All these are going to make it very hard for us to predict the future. So we can also say existence, existence of a dark matter. Uh, black holes talk about neutrinos talk about dark energy
also make also make it difficult also make it difficult to predict the future so those dark matter black holes neutrinos dark energy they are very strange that it becomes hard for us to predict the future of the universe the figure below shows some absorption spectral lines of the spectrum of calcium as observed from a source on the Earth and from a distant galaxy. Describe an absorption spectrum. Of course, an absorption spectrum is darker lines observed on a, on a bright background of a continuous spectrum. So these are darker lines. Darker lines observed. Against a bright background, dark lines observed against or on a, on a bright background. Normalities of a continuous spectrum. So you see the seven colors of the rainbow and within the seven colors you observe darker lines. So that is an absorption spectrum. Remember uh, uh, an emission spectrum is the other round. It will be bright lines on a darker background. Bright lines on a darker background. A galaxy at a distance of uh, 1.4 times 10 power 24 meters uh, to be receding from the Earth at a velocity of this, calculate the Hubble's constant based on this data. So Hubble's law V is equal to H naught times D. So Hubble's constant is simply going to be V, which is 3.4 times 10 power 7 divided by 1.4 times 10 power 24. And when I press my calculator, So from my calculator, I have Hubble's constant as 2.43 times 10 power negative 17. And since this is in meters per second, and this is in meters, my unit is per second. Calculate the distance of light, of one light year in meters. Remember I said light year is the distance traveled by light in one year. So one light year, is going to be equal to the distance traveled by light in one year and distance is speed times time. So that is the distance traveled by light in one year. So the speed of light is 3 times 10 power 8. Then the time one year is, so this is time one year. And one year is actually 300, if we take 365 days, we multiply this by 24 to change it to hours. We multiply this by 3600 to change it to uh, seconds. So this is the time in seconds. I'll just press my calculator. So from my calculator, this is approximately 9.46. 9.46 times 10 power 15. The light here is not going to be something common in your curriculum, but just in case. Uh, a star has a luminosity that is known to be that. A scientist observing the star, this star finds that the radiant flux intensity of light received on the Earth from the star is that one, 2.6 nanowatts per meter. Name the term used to describe an astronomical object that has known luminosity. So this one is simply a standard candle. A standard candle. Determine the distance of the star from the Earth. So we know that radiant flux intensity F is equal to the luminosity over 4 pi d squared. 
So they have given us uh, F as 2.6 nanowatts per meter. So it will be 2.6 times 10 power negative 9. Equaling to the luminosity is given as this one. That is 4.8 times 10 power 29. Divide by 4 pi d squared. I make D the subject. So D is going to be equal to the square root. D is going to be equal to the square root of 4.8 times 10 power 29 divided by 4 pi times 2.6 times 10 power negative 9. I place my calculator. So from my calculator, from my calculator, the distance is 3.8 times 10 power 18. The sun has a surface temperature of 5,800 Kelvin. The wavelength lambda max of light for which the maximum rate of emission occurs from the sun is that one. 500 nanometers. The scientist observing the star in A finds that the wavelength of for which the maximum rate of emission occurs from the star is that one. Show that the surface temperature of the star in A is approximately 6700 Kelvin. Explain your reasoning. So my reasoning I'll just use Wayne's displacement law. So by Wayne's displacement law By Wayne's displacement, by Wayne's displacement law, lambda maximum is equal to a constant divided by t. So I'm just going to come up with the two equations and I equate them to the same constant or I divide. So for uh, the sun, the wavelength is 500 nanometers times the surface temperature which is 5800 Kelvin this is equal to a constant that is one equation then for the star the wavelength is 430 nanometers times the surface temperature T should be called the same constant that is the second equation so I'm dividing the two equations and making T the subject so T is going to be equal to uh, 500 nanometers divided by 430 nanometers times 5800 Kelvin. So I'm pressing the calculator 500, 500, 500, 500. So this is equal to 6744 Kelvin. So the temperature is approximately 6,700 Kelvin. And lastly, use the information in A and B Roman 1 to determine the radius of the star. Information in A and B Roman 1 in A, we have actually luminosity, we have the radiant flux intensity. So uh, from the formula for luminosity, which is given in the list of formula every time, the luminosity, according to Stefan Boltzmann's law, is given by 4 pi uh, r squared, that is area, times sigma, times t power 4. So the luminosity of this, uh, the luminosity of the star has been given as 4.8 times 10 power 29. This should be equal to 4 pi times r squared times uh, uh, Stefan Boltzmann's constant is 5.67 times 10 power negative 8 times the temperature raised to power 4, which is 6700 raised to power 4. So we want to find R squared. So I just divide the luminosity by uh, 4 pi divided by 5.67 exponent negative 6. 
divide by 6,700 power 4. Do not forget the power of, of the temperature because it is T power 4. So this is giving me a 1.8 times 10 power 10. 1.8 times 10 power 10. Okay, so that marks the end of astrophysics and cosmology. That marks the end of astrophysics and cosmology. I'll add another short test to uh, tomorrow about astrophysics and cosmology, and that will be the end. Thank you. Have a good